and welcome to your damn jets. Um, first of all, I want to mention that I have a new chair. Uh, I may have a review of it, or no, not really a review, but uh, a reaction to it eventually. Uh, but uh, at the moment, I'm still trying to fix some problems with it. Um, and also, you probably notice in the background, uh, the scenery has changed a little bit. I'm cleaning my office. Um, so today, what I want to do is... Uh, talk about the second uh, opinion that I got from Johns Hopkins. So the summary so far is I had visual problems since January 2020. I had an attack of lymphoma on June 5th of 2020. Uh, I was not happy with the diagnosis I got, which was multiple sclerosis and how my case was handled. Um, since the diagnosis of MS, I made multiple trips to the ER for anxiety, gut problems, all kinds of things. Uh, and I'm generally not feeling well during that time. So now, the second opinion, I got it in Aug on August 5th, uh, 2020. I had sent to Johns Hopkins before that, a few weeks before, uh, the imaging, my medical history, and stuff that they wanted to allow me to see a, an MS specialist and they assigned to me uh, Dr. Bhargava and from now on so far I haven't mentioned doctor names because um, a lot of them are bad and there are some bad doctors that are still going to be in my story and I'm not going to mention their name I did leave reviews about them uh, telling people don't go see them because they're they're not good doctors uh, but from now on, there are some doctors that you're going to hear the name. Dr. Bhargava is an MS specialist at uh, Johns Hopkins, was assigned to me, and his second opinion uh, made uh, the entire difference between life and death, ultimately. <laughs> um, so I went to him, and he saw the same imaging that was seen at the local hospital here and had the same medical history. I'm the same person. I didn't hide anything from the hospital here. They knew I had a heart attack and I had heart disease. So Dr. Bhargava listened to me. He looked at the imaging and he said, I don't know what you have yet, but it's not a mess. Um, and there were multiple reasons for that. One of the reasons was the lack of oligoclonal bands that I had noticed before. Um, which can happen, but is not uh, the majority of cases of people with MS. Um, the other thing was that my symptoms appeared and disappeared too fast for MS. MS usually is something that is very progressive, and you're going to have like maybe uh, numbness in, in the arm or something, and it, it, it gets worse and worse and worse if it's not treated. But my thing appeared suddenly and disappeared suddenly, so for him, that was not the, an MS symptom. That was an, a symptom of something else. Uh, and, and he was right. Um, so given my history of heart disease, he was going into a vascular direction. Like he thought maybe a, a, a blood clot got lodged into my brain, something like that, or maybe I have a defect in the brain somewhere. Um, so his his approach from that point on was uh, let's let's do a vascular workup to see if that's your problem. And I have to say that it makes sense given my history and given the symptoms I had. It made sense. The only thing I will say is that uh, that opinion did nothing for uh, my mental well-being because from my perspective it's like I'm going about my life and I had the visual symptoms but at that time the visual symptoms I it seemed to me that it was a different illness so I'm going about my life and I have and one day on June 5th I have this thing that looks like a stroke and people have mentioned stroke the first neurologist I saw at the local hospital did say stroke um, then the second one they said it was MS then Dr. Bhargava says it's probably vascular, so vascular stroke is a vascular problem. Um, and I'm, I'm there and thinking after, you know, having seen Dr. Bhargava, 
if I had a stroke in, in on June 5th or a, a, a transient ischemic, ischemic attack and it, it just came out out of the blue and I didn't have any symptoms beforehand and again the visual symptoms as far as I was concerned was a different disease um, then what does that mean it, it means as far as I was concerned it meant like I can have another attack anytime now because I don't I didn't have symptoms the you know before they attacked the first time and why should I have other symptoms right now um, that would indicate that I'm going to have another attack so I could have another attack at any time uh, so for me the clock was ticking it's like okay we need to get on on the ball and check that out very quickly uh, so on August 5th, I got the second opinion. On August 11th, I contacted Dr. Polak, which he, he is a psychologist, a psychologist, um, so that I could have uh, mental help. And at first, I mean, they had given me uh, some Xanax at the, at the hospital, and I guess to my primary care physician. Excuse me. Dr. Polak was not going to um, give me more medicine or change my medicine because he's a, a psychologist, he's a psychiatrist. But it was a first step towards getting better mental uh, help. Um, then on August 11th, I mean the same day, I saw a gastroenterologist or I should say a physician's assistant uh, for my gut problems because I had gut churning that I had happened previously and I was to the ER and the ER said well you should see a gastroenterologist eventually so I saw a gastroenterologist on August 11th um, and we started you know she she asked for blood work and then the scan and, and this and that and at some point once the results started coming back in she she went on to a wild goose chase wild goose chase looking for um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'm not alcoholic, I don't drink anything. Well, I don't drink any alcohol, I drink water. Water. This is water. Uh, but, so it, it cannot be alcoholic fa fatty liver disease, it would be non-alcoholic. Uh, and one of the reasons they started looking for that is that my liver enzymes were a little bit elevated and in retrospect that was a false sign uh, but I also had the gut churning and we could not put the, the churning to any to anything we didn't know yet I had a lymphoma so the gut churning just looked strange um, so on August 29th I had an ultrasound of the liver that didn't find anything suspicious um, so I was doing the gastroenterology stuff on in parallel I was doing a cardiac a cardiac workup um, so on August 31st um, I saw Dr. Zeiler Zeiler or Zeiler Dr. Zeiler uh, who's a neurologist who specializes in strokes and we were talking about it and I said yeah you could have a transient ischemic attack and things like this uh, and he started ordering uh, tests on the same day I saw uh, my cardiologist so that he could install oh yeah I had the Holter monitor previously I had the Holter monitor and the Holter monitor didn't find anything so once you've done the Holter and the Holter doesn't find anything doesn't find any arrhythmia what you do is you go further because the holder is only 24 hours so um, after a 24 hour period if you don't, don't find anything there and you think the person might have arrhythmia you go to a another test a longer test that is supposed to last one month where you have a cardiac monitor installed on you and you keep it on all the time and for me it was a Zio because I think it's my insurance company and stuff like that. The Zio works two weeks but what they do is that they put one on and you use it for two weeks and then you remove it and you put another one on for another two weeks and then you have one month of of data to look at. So on the 31st I went to my cardiologist to get uh, my first Zio installed. Um, 
And then on September 2nd, I also stopped the gabapentin because it was hammering my white blood cell count. I mentioned it pre previously. I was using that to deal with seizures. Uh, my white blood cell count was low, so the neurologist uh, at the local hospital I was still seeing at that time said, just stop it and let's see what happens. And the the seizures didn't come back after I stopped. I was fine. So we didn't have to put me on another medicine. Um, on September 10th, I had a TEE. That's a transesophageal uh, echocardiogram. There are two types of cardiogram. They can do a cardiogram for the, from the front, which is what most people get. And I did get a bunch of cardiograms like that throughout my life because of my heart disease. But the TEE goes into the esophagus and looks at the heart from behind. And what it does is that it allows the doctor to really, because they can look from the front, but from the front they have to go to a lot of tissue. And if they can get it from the back, they can see better and they can see things that they cannot see from the front. So if there's an arrhythmia in the heart, they could possibly see it from the back. And so I had the TE on September 10th and the, the test was again clean. Um, then on September 15th, I had a CTA. I don't remember, That's I think it's an angiogram of the brain. Mm -hmm. I'm not certain how it works. I had a CTA that was ordered by Dr. Zeiler. Uh, I had an MR, another MRI that was ordered by Dr. Bhargava. Um, and then on the 16th, I had the second zeal installed on me. Uh, I guess the day before I did the tests uh, at the, the CTA and the MRI. And I did, at that time, I didn't need to not have any device on me. So that was the day that we set aside for tests. And then the 16th, I, I, I had returned the, the previous zeal, I think on the 14th or something. And then on the 16th, I got the second one installed. Uh, on the 18th, I saw Dr. Jones at Johns Hopkins, who's a lipid specialist, and this was life-changing for me. Um, because the first thing he did, he, he listened to me, and he listened to my history and the heart attack at 24, and my family, we have familial hypercholesterolemia, which is com well, I wouldn't say common, but it's, it's prevalent more among French Canadians. Uh, so you may not have uh, ever heard of that, but French Canadians have a tendency to get the, the, the genes that cause that. And some people have it worse than I do, actually. I remember when I was younger, after my heart attack, that I saw on TV a, a documentary about two kids uh, that were younger than I was and had um, quite a bit of uh, problems with uh, with that because I think they had they, they managed to get the gene from their father and their mother at the same time. Uh, which is really bad. Uh, so that doctor listened to my history and he says, we're going to put you in a PCSK9 inhibitor. And, and this made all the difference. I know now, I know now this made all the difference. I'm going to talk about it again later. But at that time, what happened is that it had to be approved by the insurance and there were paperwork and there was this and there was that and the insurance refused it first and then they, ha they had to resubmit with more paperwork or something, I don't know. But by the time it was approved, I was either, uh, I had been seen, um, at Inova, and they were telling me that you probably have primary sinus lymphoma. All was already in chemo. I don't remember the timeline exactly. But we decided to put aside the PCSK9 inhibitor until after I was treated uh, with my chemo to not add a whole bunch of, of things on top of my treatment. Uh, so, lessons learned. Um, And I'm going to sound like a broken record, but get if if your diagnosis is obscure to you, get a second opinion. If your diagnosis seems wrong, get a second opinion. If it if things don't seem to fit right, get a second opinion. It will either confirm the first opinion or you're going to get a, something fairly different which could save your life. And I think in this case, it did save my life. Um, 
that was something that came to mind. Oh, another thing that I like to tell people when I say get a second opinion is that sometimes a doctor can give you an opinion and he explains it and somehow the explanation misses the mark somewhere. He doesn't know that, that you have a confusion somewhere. Uh, like, and even you may tell him and it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, there's no meaning of the mind. It's like the diagnosis is correct, but the explanation that goes with it doesn't seem to fit in your mind. If you get a second opinion and the second opinion confirms the first opinion, the second opinion, the explanation that comes with it may be more um, uh, convincing to you as a patient, like, oh yeah, you're right. This is what I have. So if you are confused, if, if you're confused about your diagnosis, get that second opinion. If it's a life-changing um, diagnosis, I would suggest getting a second opinion, even if you're not particularly confused about it, but you may get the the the, doc, the second doctor might agree with the first may explain it better may give you it, it may agree with the diagnosis but may not agree on treatment it may su suggest a different uh, treatment uh, in my case that was not really possible but for other people they can have multiple avenues for treatment so you may get the second treatment so i'm going to be like a broken record until probably the end of the the series that get the second opinion when it's life altering or you're not sure about the diagnosis um, and you're going to see later I'm going to come back again on that it, it, it did save I, in my opinion it did save my life um, so uh, yeah that's all I had to say about uh, about the event of the second opinion when I got the second opinion and what it did to me uh, in the next episode, I'm going to talk about the few hospitalizations I had before they diagnosed uh, me with uh, a primary CNS lymphoma. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye for now and uh, see you in the next episode. Or the, as I mentioned before, there are parallel episodes I'm planning to... to uh, put together. Uh, you may see me in a parallel episode first. Uh, so see you later.